In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance family. And as always, let's start by turning to Mary. Mary's uh, known as the Mother of God. Mary's the Mother of the Church. Mary's the Mother of each and every one of us. And at the end of that beautiful prayer, that's the Hail Holy Queen. We say Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary also is, in the eyes of the Trinity, Mary is the daughter of God the Father, the mother of God the Son, and Mary is the mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. So let's turn to Mary and ask for her intercession, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's ask our spiritual guide to, to be with us. And our spiritual guide, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is our counselor. The Holy Spirit is our consoler. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the counselor and consoler. St. Paul goes on to say, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Abba, Father. And once we're baptized, the Holy Spirit is the sweet guest of our souls. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of joy, and a lot of love in the very depths of our hearts as we sing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me. Use me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now in us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint 
Faustina, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Andre Bessette, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome you all to our Perseverance family. Traditionally, January 6th has been a day in which we celebrate the Epiphany, but in most places the Epiphany is celebrated on Sundays, and we actually celebrated the Epiphany last Sunday. But still invite all of us to imitate the kings. The kings followed the star. And I invite all of you to think, what were the who are the stars in your life? That star led the kings into Jerusalem and then changed route and led the kings to the stable of Bethlehem where they found Jesus in the arms of Mary. And as a bumper sticker points out, wise men still find Jesus in the arms of Mary. And then they prostrate themselves. What does it mean to prostrate? You bow, they bow down before Jesus. And they recognize, even though he was in a cave, surrounded by animals, very humble mother and father, still they recognize through faith that this little child was the king. So they prostrate themselves before him. And they brought with them in their coffers gifts. These gifts were that of gold and frankincense <coughs> and myrrh. Gold symbolizing the gift that would be given to the king. And frankincense would be a gift given to God, myrrh, a gift given to Jesus in his humanity. So gold represents the royalty of the king, incense, the divinity of God himself, and finally myrrh, humanity, that Christ was destined to suffer and die for us on the cross. Those are the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, what are the three gifts that you can give? We mentioned this. Gold is, maybe it's an attitude of life that you can assume this new year. An attitude in which you will simply buy less, not be overcome by materialism. Don't allow your possessions to possess you. There's that gold. Then frankincense, which represents God himself. How about trying to grow in your prayer life? We're here because we want to persevere in our prayer life. We want to persevere in our holy hour. So if we've been negligent in our holy hour, this might be the time, the beginning of the new year, to make a firm commitment, I will be faithful to my holy hour. I will get up a little bit earlier. I'll find the time, the place, and I will give the Lord that hour. Fulton Sheen calls it the hour of power. Giving the Lord your best. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh represents the sacrifice 
the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, sacrificing his humanity, being nailed to the cross for love of you and for love of me, shedding his precious blood for our salvation. So we might make this proposal this year to make a sacrifice. And our sacrifice could be to give up sin. Our worst enemy is that of sin. What we might do also is try the beginning of this new year to form the habit of going to confession more frequently and bring your children. Make it a habit of going to confession frequently. There's a book written on confession that I mentioned maybe about a month ago by a mother of a family. Her name was Marianne Budnick, and she wrote a book maybe about 20 years ago, Seeking for Peace, Why Not Try Confession? She noticed in her family that when her children started to fight and bicker and quarrel, it's because they hadn't been to confession for a long time. So she told them, it, we're fighting too much now, time to go to confession. So she take their children in the car and bring them into the church. And one by one, they'd go to confession. She would go, I think her husband too. Then the family would be at peace. Because if we're at peace with God, we're at peace with ourselves, we're going to be at peace with our family members. For that reason, Fulton Sheen says that the world war breaks out when there are a lot of individual wars waging in the hearts of individuals. What he's saying is that if I have war within my heart because sin is reigning in me, then I transmit that to my family, my town, my city, my state, my country, my continent. When you have enough people that have wars waging in their individual hearts, then <clears throat> the bomb falls. So let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, as the song goes. And as Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. St. Francis says, make me a channel of your peace. And St. Augustine defines peace as the tranquility of order. Tranquility of order. We want to strive to maintain moral, spiritual order in our lives by getting rid of sin. That comes about by making good sacramental confessions. Just go through the steps. Five steps, examination of conscience, sorrow for sin, firm purpose of amendment, confess your mortal sins in number, and type to the priest, then carry out the penance. By doing that, you have made a good confession, and one of the fruits of a good confession is peace of mind, heart, and soul. So, what I'd like to ask all of you now is um, to try to imitate the kings. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that means give up materialism, give more prayer, and make your holy hour 
and give up sin. If we can do that, then we are imitating the kings, giving our own gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Amen. My friends in Christ, this week is a wonderful week in the sense that we celebrate the North American saints. If you remember, two days ago we celebrated St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, who was a convert from Episcopalianism. She lost her husband. She converted Catholicism and lost her friends and family members. Then she founded a religious order, the Daughters of Charity. She became the mother, foundress, and she's known as the patron of modern Catholic education. She died at 46 years of age and was canonized by Pope Paul VI in 1975. Her, bury, her body is buried in Emmitsburg, Maryland. St. Elizabeth Ann Bailey Seton. Pray for us in a special way for modern education. That we would have good Catholic schools throughout the world. Elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, higher learning, Catholic colleges. Let's pray to her for intercession for good Catholic Good, solid Catholic education. Then yesterday we celebrate another saint that was sanctified in the United States. His name was St. John Neumann. He was born in Bohemia, which today would be the Czech, Czech Republic. Wanted to be a priest, a missionary. When he finished his studies at 23 in Bohemia, the bishop said there were already enough priests. So he traveled from his country to the United States. He disembarked in New York. He had one dollar in his pocket. And then the bishop ordained him a priest two weeks after he had arrived. The bishop sent him to western part of New York to Buffalo. We worked with the immigrants, the German immigrants. But he experienced a lot of a lot of loneliness. So he asked the bishop if he could enter into a religious order. He was given permission and transferred to he ends up in Philadelphia, the area of Philadelphia, and he becomes a redemptorist. Then when he's about, in his early 40s, he gets a letter from Rome in which the Holy Father wanted him to be the new bishop of Philadelphia, which is among the most highly cultured intellectual diocese in the world. He was almost in shock, but he obeyed. And when he starts out as bishop, a man of great faith, he dedicates himself to building up that diocese. The gospel yesterday was Jesus was preaching and he saw the people there like sheep without a shepherd. And his heart was moved to compassion. <clears throat> Bishop Neumann felt the same way. So uh, among the many accomplishments that he had was he started to build churches and schools. When he arrived, there were just two churches in Philadelphia. He's going to be a bishop only for about seven years. 
By the time he dies, there are a hundred. So he's instrumental in building 98 churches. The next the churches were built schools. So he is the basically he the initiator of what is called the diocesan parochial school system. So we take it for granted that there's a parish and next to it there's a Catholic school. He's the one that basically started that in motion. And he started also what's called 40 hours devotion. 40 hours devotion in which he would encourage parishes at least once a year to have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament around the clock for 40 hours. And every hour there would be people coming in, replacing those who had made their holy hour. When he was 48 years of age, walking down street, downtown Philadelphia and Vine Street in the snow, he collapsed and he died of heart attack. He was only 48. St. Elizabeth Ann Seat was only 46. It's interesting how these individuals were able to carry out so much in a relatively short period of time. And that, le that, that, that leads us to the saint that we celebrate today is a fascinating saint. And then we'll try to connect these saints to the Word of God that we're meditating upon in the, in the Mass. So the saint that we celebrate today is not from He's not from the, the United States, but rather he's from Montreal, Canada. And the name of this saint, who was canonized in the year 2010 by Pope Bennett the 16th, 10 years ago, his name is Saint Andre Besset. Here's a picture of him. Saint Andre Besset. Fascinating saint. And given that we are in the year of Saint Joseph, he's very important for the year of Saint Joseph. Because he had great devotion to Saint Joseph. And given that today, in this year is dedicated to St. Joseph the whole year up until December 8th, the feast day of the Immaculate Conception. We want to turn to him and beg him for many graces, but especially his great devotion to St. Joseph. He was born in Montreal, the French-speaking part of Canada, on August 9th, 1845. And he's going to die January 6th, dying today, actually. January 6th, 1937. And he's from Canada, beatified in 1982. But he was canonized 2010. He would be considered in the eyes of the world to have been a failure because he simply couldn't carry out many jobs that he tried to do. He came from a relatively poor family. It's kind of funny because he's born in 1845 and he dies 1937. He lived to be uh, 
91 years of age and he he was he was sickly his whole life but he goes on to live into the 90s and the thing about that is that even though our, our health not might not be perfect god is the one that sustains us and i think more and more we have to rely upon god's help As we say in the psalm, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Andres Bissette, yes, he was sickly most of his life. He could barely read and write. And he became famous and well-beloved, especially because of his holiness. He was eight of 12 children. It's interesting years ago how parents were really open to life. Open to having a big family. And even today the church encourages that. Very often when couples are open to life, open to having a big family, then God will give a vocation a religious vocation. I live with a priest that is one of 13 from a farm family, Father Dave. And he also has a brother that's an oblate priest in Argentina for 30 years. They are two of 13, 12 boys and one girl from a farming family in Indiana. I'm one of nine. Often when parents say yes to a big family, then God will bless them with a vocation. So one of the reasons why there are less vocations is because Catholics are deciding not to have families that are big. Sure, we're going through a pandemic now, we're going through tough times, but we've always gone through tough times. We read through the life of this great saint, he just had trial after trial after trial after trial. He came from the, this big family and uh, of 12. He was bat baptized Alfred, not Aunt Andre. His pa parents were French Canadians. And look at all the trials. And his parents died early when... Both his mom and died before he was 12 years of age. And so he became, his aunt's uncle and aunt adopted him. He became a farmhand. He failed at that. He became a shoemaker. He failed at that. He became a baker. He failed at that. He became a blacksmith. He failed at that. So almost everything that he tried to do, he failed at it. His life seemed to be a dismal failure, but he never gave up. So this is what happened. He tried to enter into some religious congregations and he was rejected. He rejected, he rejected because of weakness of health until finally he knocked at the door in Montreal of a congregation, the congregation of the Holy Cross, of the Holy Cross. And guess what? They told him to leave. But what happened was they told him to leave. But the bishop, the bishop back then, recognized there was something special about Andre. And he told the congregation of the Holy Cross to accept him. So he was accepted 
And uh, he didn't have good health, so they thought, why are we going to accept this man who doesn't have health? But the bishop said, accept him anyway. So there he became, he, he, he stayed in their congregation for 70 years. And he became the beloved doorkeeper of the college of Notre Dame. This is not Notre Dame in Indiana, but Notre Dame in Montreal. And basically what he was, he was the doorkeeper. That would be one of the responsibilities of the brothers. He would, people would come to the door and he would welcome them and ask what they wanted and he would pray for them. <clears throat> now, the key to his greatness was obviously not his physical strength or his talents. But the key to his greatness was his deep prayer life. He had a very, very deep prayer life. He had a humble room. And near his door, he had a statue. He had a statue of St. Joseph. Here's a statue of St. Joseph. He had a statue of St. Joseph there on his window still, window sill. And he had a great love for St. Joseph. So I invite all of you this year to try to draw closer to St. Joseph. Pray to St. Joseph. Love St. Joseph. Turn to St. Joseph. Entrust your life to St. Joseph. Entrust your family to St. Joseph. We're celebrating the 150th anniversary in which the Pope proclaimed St. Joseph as the universal patron of the church. But also St. Joseph is the patron. He's the patron saint of, of families. So during this pandemic, let's turn to St. Joseph and beg St. Joseph to help us. Now, he would spend many hours at night in prayer. That's encouraging all of you as a New Year's proposal, the gifts that the kings brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, to try to be more prayerful this year. Yes, I repeat, try to be more prayerful this year. To be faithful to your holy hour. He would spend not one hour, but many hours in prayer at night. So he wouldn't spend a lot of time in bed sleeping, but rather in, in talking to St. Joseph. Talking to Mary. Talking to Jesus. You can talk to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph whenever you want. They're always ready to listen to us. So, in time, <clears throat> it was discovered that Andre had healing powers. He had healing powers. So what he would do, at least the beginning of his religious life, he would go off to the homes and he would visit the sick, those who are really suffering a lot from some type of sickness. He'd visit homes, visit the sick. And he would pray with them. 
not only pray for them, but he would get them to pray also. Then he had this special oil. And he would actually rub this oil upon them, on their ailment. And they'd be cured. And this happened not just once or twice, but many times. So people heard of this. And as a result, more and more people started to seek him out. So he no longer would be visiting homes there in Montreal, but the people would be coming to him. It's interesting how sanctity attracts. We see this also in the life of Christ. But Jesus would be preaching and healing and throngs of people, multitudes of people. We saw this yesterday in the gospel. Jesus is preaching to the multitude, thousands of people, and they don't have enough to eat. And Jesus asked the apostles to bring what they have. They bring five loaves and fish. Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish so that thousands can eat. Sanctity is magnetic. Sanctity attracts. So pray that you will be like Andres. You'll be able to attract people, not so much to yourself, but attract people to God. Attract people back to confession. Attract people to go to Mass. Attract people to pray the rosary. Because the saints, they don't point to themselves. They don't do that. The saints don't point to themselves, but they point to God. Like John the Baptist, who saw Jesus walking. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Andrew and John got up, left John the Baptist, and they followed Christ. Like the saints, we should be like a signpost that's pointing to Christ. We have to be a signpost that points to Christ. Be magnetic. But our magnetism should be bringing people closer to Christ. So what happened was, because of his, his, his deep prayer life, his great devotion to St. Joseph, and his love, especially for the poor and the sick and the suffering, who often you see in the lives of the saints how they have a great love for the poor, the sick, the suffering, the marginalized, like Jesus, who, who loved Everyone, but he had a special love for the blind and the lame and the deaf and the mute and the sick. The saints have a tender spot for those who suffer. So should we. So should we bring the, suck, the suffering, the sick to Christ, as well as ourselves, because we all have our ailments, be they, be they moral, emotional, or physical. And God hears our prayer. God hears us. And this is what happened. People would come for healing and spiritual direction, and he would give them a little bit of advice, too. Don't forget, he's not a priest. He's a humble lay brother of the Congregation of the Holy Cross. He can barely read and write. But his advice was very simple. And what he would do is, he would basically tell the people to go to St. Joseph, in so many words. If you go to St. Joseph, St. Joseph will help you. 
And it's true that St. Joseph will not fail us. St. Teresa of Avila, who promoted devotion to St. Joseph, she was healed of a very serious sickness. She was about to die. They actually thought that she was dead. St. Teresa of Avila, and she was healed. She attributed her healing to St. Joseph. His powerful intercession. St. Joseph, she said, all the saints will help out, but St. Joseph is much quicker, more efficacious. So, Brother Andres, Andre, would say this, how humble he was. I don't heal. It's not me. I don't have healing powers. He said, it is St. Joseph that heals, who cures. He said, I am just his little dog, his little puppy. Calling himself the little puppy dog, the little puppy dog, the little dog of St. Joseph. He would minister to the people, they'd be at the door. Hundreds of them waiting to see this humble lay brother who could barely read and write. He seemed to fail at everything. He couldn't, was failed at baking and farm work and a blacksmith and shoemaker. Everything seemed to be a failure to him, but not in his relationship to God. He was a, he was a huge success in his love for the poor. He would tend the people, minister the people from eight to ten hours a day. Can you imagine that? From eight to ten hours a day, he would be welcoming the people. He would be giving them advice. He'd be praying with them. He would give their intentions to St. Joseph. And don't forget, this is the extraordinary thing, is that he didn't have health. How did he do it? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God is our strength. So in your weakness, we're all weak. We're all weak physically, morally, emotionally. Let's turn to God and ask God to give us strength. Let's ask St. Joseph to give us strength. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, <clears throat> in the meantime, he became more and more popular. The people basically, they loved him. So, he ends up with four secretaries that were busy in handling the letters that people sent to him. So, not only would the people come to visit him in person, But also people would correspond to him by writing him letters. You know how many how many letters that he would receive every year? Listen, 80,000 letters every year. Eighty thousand letters every year. Extraordinary, isn't it? So <laughs> those four secretaries are maybe working harder than Brother Andre in responding to his letters. 
So you're working with the saint. The saint gets you to work too. Now here's a miracle. You see, his title would be the Miracle Worker of Montreal. Here's one of the most famous miracles. The Holy Cross community. They had their house next to a, a plot of land nearby. And they're trying to purchase that land from the owners of the land, but in vain, for many years, so that they could build upon it and it would help them for their, their college and um, for, to attend the people also. But the people who owned the land were very resistant Now, what Brother Andres did was this. He took, he took a medal, took a medal. This happened to be a medal of St. John Bosco, no? Took a, took a medal, but it wasn't a medal of St. John Bosco. By the way, it's going to be his feast day in about, in, in, a, in a few weeks. I'm sure that St. John Bosco had a great love for, um, I'm not going to say San Andres because St. John Bosco uh, had lived almost the same time, but St. John Bosco had great had devotion to St. Joseph too. So Andres, Brother Andres, he took the medal and he buried it. He buried the medal on that property of the people. <laughs> they didn't know it. But he buries the metal on the property. And suddenly, the owners agreed to sell the land. So that was through the intercession, that was the, through the intercession of Brother Andres but also through the intercession of great St. Joseph. Of great St. Joseph. So then Andres raised money to build a small chapel. So he'd be begging to money to build a chapel and then a small church on the property. Then he even cut hair for five cents. Hopefully he did that well. Hopefully he cut the hair well. Okay, maybe that was one of his successes in cutting hair. My father, with the nine of us having a big family, my father would say that the, my father would say this, that the even the worst haircut can be remedied. Even the worst haircut can be remedied in four weeks. See if we can pick that one up. Even the worst haircut can be remedied in, in four weeks. If you don't understand the joke, it's because your hair is going to grow back in four weeks. Uh, you now you got it, huh? So St. Andres would cut hair, and he's raising money for a chapel, now a, a little church. <clears throat> and at the church, he received visitors, cured people. And once the people were cured, they would come, and, they would come sometimes with their crutches and their canes. They would leave their crutches and their canes there in the church. So what's happening is this little chapel becomes a church. And the church becomes an oratory. 
and it becomes the most famous oratory, the famous, most famous oratory dedicated to St. Joseph in the world. It's the oratory of St. Joseph. The biggest, the most famous oratory in the world. And it's dedicated to St. Joseph. And it's on the hill there in Montreal. Years ago, I went to visit this oratory with my parents who live in New Hampshire. It was about a four hour drive, just going north. And there uh, is the body of Andres. I went there when he was still a blessed, because he was canonized in the year 2010 by Pope Benedict XVI, and he was beatified in 1982. So this is in Montreal, Canada. Remember traveling there with my parents. In the upper church, I didn't didn't feel was really that attractive, seemed to be quite modern. But the fact that his body is buried there is the most important. Well, even more important, you have the Blessed Sacrament. But if you have the opportunity to make a pilgrimage, maybe in the future after the pandemic is over, making a pilgrimage in honor of St. Joseph, then visit the oratory. And below there's a crypt. In the crypt is what I will really like best because you have plaques, little portraits in honor. In honor of <clears throat> the different titles given to St. Joseph in the litany. And one of my favorites was the title of St. Joseph, under the title of St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. So in our battle against evil, in our battle against evil, we want to fight the good fight. We want to run the good race. We want to turn to good St. Joseph. Actually, when the church carries out an exorcism, when the church carries out an exorcism, that person is diagnosed of being possessed by a devil, and it happens, there is a rite called the rite of exorcism. In this rite of exorcism, the church invokes <clears throat> the holy name of Jesus. The church invokes the holy name of Mary. The church invokes St. Michael the Archangel. The church invokes St. Benedict. The church invokes St. Joseph. One of the titles for St. Joseph is he's known as the Terror of Demons. The terror of demons. The der demons are terrified at the name of St. Joseph. <clears throat> so you see in the plaque, this man surrounded by devils. He's surrounded by devils and he's praying to St. Joseph and the devils are, are terrified. They're recoiling at the name of St. Joseph. So Andres, Andre Bisset is his name. Andre Bisset, the weak failure in the eyes of the world. He seemed to be a failure in the eyes of the world. The weak failure. Let God use him 
to accomplish great things. He is known as the Miracle Man of Montreal. The Miracle Man of Montreal. Miracle Man. So for that reason, he would say, go to St. Joseph, I am just his little dog. How humble. Go to St. Joseph, because I'm just his little dog. What? The saints are very humble. Very, very humble. You know, when he died, there are 2,000, Two million people that go to his oratory every year. That's a lot. Two million. When he died also, there were a million people that surrounded his, his tomb. That's huge in number. John Paul II had the biggest, of course. Trusting in this great, great saint. Trust in his great saint. He is the first canonized, made saint, the first canonized male saint in Canada. And ask you to pray for the people in Canada. Because the church is going through, the church over the past few years has gone through a lot of problems in Canada, as well as here. So the Canadians have devotion to St. Joseph. They have great devotion to St. Anne, who is the mother of Jesus, and the grand St. Anne is the grandmother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But they have great devotion to St. Joseph. So in this year of St. Joseph, let's let's also turn to Saint Andres, Saint Andre Besset. Here's a portrait of this modern saint. I like I like purposely to put him not so much next to me, but next to Saint Joseph. He would say, Go to Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph will never fail you. Go to Saint Joseph. As the Pharaoh said, go to Joseph and in Egypt, we say, go to St. Joseph through the intercession of St. No longer blessed, but St. Andre Bessette. So before giving my priestly blessing, I would like to say a prayer in honor of St. Joseph and St. Andre Bessette. And this prayer is in honor of the Epiphany. It's honor of the Holy Family. As we celebrate the feast day of the Holy Family, about 10 days ago, shortly after Christmas. And in the Holy Family of St. Joseph, ask St. Joseph to bless your family, to bless your family with, with great graces, and here's the prayer. If you know the prayer, you can pray the prayer with me. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, make my heart like unto yours. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, I breathe forth my soul unto you, unto thee. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving. be every moment thine. So through the intercession of St. Joseph and St. Andre Bisset, 
through their powerful intercession. May God bless all of you in a very, very special way. I'll give you my priestly blessing. Almighty God bless you all in a special way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.